Clustering is not a wrapping of a thick blanket to keep warm, but more like a desperate struggle to crowd closer to the fire or die. In a study published just last year, researchers found bees made conscious decisions to avoid extreme heat, heat hot enough to cause discomfort. This ability is consistent with a capacity for pain experiences in insects. Given the potential ethical implications of our research, the precautionary principle dictates that the possibility of insect pain and suffering should be taken seriously in insect research laboratories, as well as insect conservation. What about beekeeping? Because it looks like beekeeping are torturing their bees. Honeybees suffer unnecessarily in human-made hives. This is from Honeybee Cluster, Not Insulation, But Stressful Heat Sink by Derek Mitchell. The interesting part of this study is that Derek Mitchell is not a beekeeper or a bee conservationist or a vegan, to my knowledge. He is an engineer. He's a PhD candidate in mechanical engineering at the University of Leeds. It was his wife who started beekeeping as a hobby, I guess, at which point he noticed something a little weird. The hives beekeepers used were at odds with what I knew about heat transfer and what beekeepers had told me about honeybees. I thought I could build better hives, so I started out trying to find the requirements of the honeybees and found out that nobody knew in terms that made engineering sense. He discovered that 100 plus years of beekeeping practice was based on essentially a lie, a huge misunderstanding of bee behavior. This came from studying bees primarily using man-made hives rather than in the wild. And these hives were several times thinner than the trees the bees would inhabit in the wild during the winter. They thought, and still think, the ways in which honeybees cluster together when it's cold acts as insulation and keeps them warm and is good for them. This is a good natural behavior and something that should be encouraged by beekeepers. To the point some American beekeepers actually chill their bees. They essentially refrigerate their bees during the summer in order to keep them cold and encourage this clustering. But my study shows that clustering is a distress behavior rather than a benign reaction to falling temperatures. Deliberately inducing clustering by practice or poor hive design may be considered poor welfare or even cruelty. Basically, honeybees form these clusters, this like disc of bees, and the center is called the core, unsurprisingly, and then the outer layers of bees is called the mantle. We do so love to refer to sentient beings as things. Anyway, beekeepers, people who have studied this, this is in peer-reviewed research, believe that the mantle insulates the core, the entire cluster. So the outer layer of bees keeps all the bees warm. But the mantle does the opposite. It acts as a heat sink, transferring heat away from the cluster. Think of a down jacket. It's the air gap between the feathers that help keep the wearer warm. Honeybee clusters are similar to the action of compressing a down jacket, whereby the thermal conductivity eventually increases to that of a dense solid of feathers, more like a leather jacket. So beekeepers have been chilling their bees, torturing their bees, some for the entire year. This is often seen as a benign or even a necessary process with beekeeping and academic research considering these conditions of extreme heat loss compared with the honeybee's natural habitat as natural and normal. Which is kind of the history of humanity, right? Like we did a thing at the expense of another person or another animal because that thing benefited us and because we convinced ourselves that it was benign or we truly believed that it was benign. And time and time and time again, we've been proven wrong. We thought crowding chickens in barns with little to no access to the outdoors was benign because chickens are dumb, they can't feel pain. We were wrong. We thought letting fish suffocate was benign because fish don't feel pain, obviously. We were wrong. We thought giving bees a nice place to live while taking their food was fine because it's natural. We're recreating their environment. We're encouraging clustering, which is good for them. We were wrong. And yet the more compassionate beekeepers who have thought, hmm, maybe this isn't right. Maybe forcing my bees to be cold, forcing them to huddle together. These beekeepers have been called irrational and emotional. That last reference is from a beekeeper and pollinator researcher, and it was written very recently, 2020. Sure enough, she talks about the naturalness of clustering and says, it may make you feel better emotionally to insulate and add quilt boxes and vent and wrap. But this is what people do, right? If you point out that, hey, maybe something is cruel to name your animal, pick your animal. 
oh, well, you're just emotional. You don't care for these animals regularly. You're not a beekeeper. You're not a farmer. So what do you know? She's the expert, right? There are almost no ethics standards for insects, but there is growing evidence that insects feel pain. A 2022 study found that bumblebees react to potentially harmful stimuli in a way that is similar to pain responses in humans. So this was really nice to see. This is from Derek Mitchell, the engineer, the author of the study. Usually when people talk about bee conservation or even bee welfare. It's from a very human-centered point of view. We care about bees not for their sake, not because they can suffer, but because of what they do for us, right? Providing honey, pollinating other foods. I mean, that winter bee piece has nothing to say about bee welfare. It's all about having superior genetic stock and keeping bees in good condition. That's how you talk about creatures when they're a product to you, right? You don't talk about sentient creatures that way when you actually put their needs before the products that they make for you. So it's both nice and I guess discouraging to see someone outside of the bee industry clearly care a lot more about bees than people within the industry, though, I mean, that's not surprising. Derek Mitchell doesn't make money off of bees. He merely saw a problem, learned about bee behavior and bee sentience, and made the obvious conclusion that forcing them to be cold enough to huddle together in an attempt to stay warm bad, actually. He has no financial incentive to believe refrigerating bees is good for them. Spoiler alert, there is a financial incentive, of course. To me, this represents the main argument against eating, you know, ethical honey, eggs, milk. You don't know how the animals are treated, and even if you do, that doesn't necessarily mean that's the way they should be treated. We could be wrong. So that local natural honey or whatever you're buying from a farmer's market, maybe that beekeeper is keeping his bees cold because he thinks that's best for them. Is that really ethical? Intention aside, the end result is the same. It's, it's harm to bees so we can have honey. It made me think of the, there's two examples I can think of, of people with pets doing cute things with them and actually it's harmful. There's the bunny um, in the sink, I think, under running water. No, you're stressing them out and bunnies can die from being stressed out. They're like such sensitive creatures. Um, I the other one was a some sort of wild animal. I forgot what it was, but there was like a tickling thing. And again, people were like, no, 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 you're torturing these guys. And there's no financial incentive there, right? That's just people caring for these animals and thinking they're doing something cute and not recognizing the signs because we're not bunnies. <laughs> then when you throw money into the mix, when you commodify these sentient creatures, well, now there's a huge incentive to ignore even the seemingly obvious cruelties. And finally, natural. I mean, even if this were natural, which it is, the clustering is a natural response to being cold. They are trying to keep warm. That doesn't mean it's pleasant. Like that doesn't mean it's something you should recreate. Infections are natural. Starving to death is natural. <laughs> I just don't think that's an argument anyone would ever make if they put be safety and welfare at the forefront. Actually, it's not the last thing I want to say. The last thing I want to say, there's so much, there's just so much harm to animals. And even something like this that I think most people would consider so small, it's so upsetting. I mean, I've never cried about bees before. <laughs> I've said that, you know, it's harder for me to care about insects, but here I am crying about bees being cold, you know? <laughs> there's just so much we don't know about animals, about bees. And the more we do learn, the more we learn that we're just really, really horrible to most animals. I've just been sitting here for like five minutes trying to think of a more positive way to end this video. And I don't know, maybe beekeepers will take this seriously. I mean, I doubt this will affect like commercial beekeeping, but possibly the hobbyists, maybe it'll have an impact there. Even though I wouldn't purchase honey even if they didn't keep their bees cold, it still would be an improvement for the bees, right, to no longer do that, to actually have them in properly insulated hives. Speaking of bugs, we have a bunch of little spiders <laughs> coming out of our Christmas tree. I think that's where they're coming from. I've never seen these little guys before, and they all just happen to be right above the Christmas tree on the ceiling. <laughs> we went and got a Christmas tree from an actual 
Christmas tree farm. Went and chopped down our own tree. <laughs> Christmas vacation style. No, again, we went to a farm and got, you know, a Douglas fir. It's not a huge like tree trunk, right? But yeah, the fun consequence of that has been more spiders in the house, but at least they're little tiny ones and they're on the ceiling. That's fine. It's the big ones that come out. Oh, I hate them. I know. I, bugs. I love bugs now, but like, God damn it. Why are they so fast? They're so fast. We did not have these in Memphis, or at least I didn't see them. We had these like, the, the bigger ones tended to be really slow. They just hang out on the ceilings and they walk like really slow. I don't think they make webs. They walk around to hunt, but they're super slow, which is weird, right? You think speed would be advantageous there. But yeah, the ones here, very, very fast, so fast and big and just, oh my God, when we first moved into this house, because no one had lived here for like a while, oh, there were so many, there were so many. I remember sitting on the couch watching Doom, <laughs> fantastic movie, highly recommend. And there's just one running along the ceiling. Huh. Saw one this morning, had to get a cup, put a little cup on him, wait for partner to get up and get him outside, try to remember the cups there so I don't knock it over and end up with a spider on my slipper. <laughs> but I love them. I love insects. Spider's actually not an insect. I have been told over and over again by my seven-year-old who is obsessed <laughs> with insects and spiders. Arachnids. Ticks are arachnids. So it's spiders, scorpions, ticks. How spider not bug? Anyway, thank you so much for watching, guys. I really hope you enjoyed it. And I really hope you subscribe and like the video and hit the bell notifications when I upload a new video. Thank you so much to my patrons at patreon.com and here on YouTube. I post two exclusive videos a month for tier two patrons and members. One is a vlog and the other is a controversial topic. I just posted what well, I was going to say for this month, but I think this is the last day of the month. For November, I just posted the controversial video talking about chicken pox, chicken pox vaccine, and shingles. I've really enjoyed doing the controversial videos. This is the first year I've ever done that. I used to just do two kind of vlog style videos a month. Um, I really enjoy making one a controversial video. It is a lot more work than, you know, I would put on a vlog or something, but it's really stimulating for me, I guess rewarding for me because there's a lot of stuff that I wanna talk about that doesn't really fit on the channel or would just get me in trouble. And like, I like getting in trouble, but sometimes, sometimes it's too much, you know, and it's not, it's maybe not good, like for the channel and what I'm trying to do here. You know what I mean? So uh, yeah, it's good to have like another place to kind of talk about stuff. Point is, I'm definitely going to keep doing it. I'm definitely going to do it for 2024 as well. All right, that's it for me. New video soon. This sweater I get complimented on so often. Just recently when I went out, every single store, every cashier I had at every store complimented me on the sweater. It's Labyrinth for those who don't know. It's not looking great at this point. It's got all the little, what do you call it? The little balls, right? It needs to be like, I don't know. What do you do? What do you do with sweaters? How do you fix that? Can you fix that? I don't own nice things. I just have t-shirts for a reason. I don't want to have to deal with different materials and you can't wash it, whatever. Yeah, I definitely have washed this and um, it's not as cute as it used to be. It's still held up like really well and it's surprisingly good quality. I think it was from like a an ugly sweater shop or something, which like, what the f This is not, what? This is not ugly. <laughs> I love this so much. It's such a great design. I guess the worst part would be the the Ludo. He's a little goofy looking. Point is, this is probably the nicest piece of clothing I own. And it's from an ugly sweater website. Someone said the little trees look like butt plugs. So like, I, I can't take them down now, right? <laughs> I think they need to be there year round. I mean, they're too pointy, right? Not that I'm an expert or anything, but aren't they a little too pointy? I'm really tempted to <laughs> Google butt plug. <laughs> I already Googled two girls, one cup today. So like stuff up your little swine. It's a pigtail. It's on Amazon. <laughs> Artist giant Christmas tree sculpture. <laughs> okay. Mine are definitely less butt plugish than that. These Christmas trees I found at Target. Yeah. These are, um, yeah. Cause mine close up, they have little, uh, you know, they have some texture, right? But uh, yeah, I guess from far away. Perfect, exactly what I intended.